Today's program is brought to you by Whole Foods Market, a dynamic leader in the quality food business, a mission-driven company that aims to set the standards of excellence for food retailers. For more information, visit WholeFoodsMarket.com. I'm Julia Tertian, host of Radio Cherry Bomb. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes.
I'm half your host, Aaron Bresnitz. I'm your other host, Greg Bresnitz. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. Come to the end of this year. Celebrate 50th anniversary. Another comp. 100 pizzas. <laughs> lots of salads. Lots of salad. Um, lots, of, lots of tunes. Lots of snacks. Lots of snacks. And lots of trends. Lots of trends. Uh, it was a good year. Great year. Um, and we have two very special guests with us. Why don't you guys introduce yourself to the worldwide listeners of Snacky Tunes? Gentlemen first. Gentlemen first. <laughs> I'm Michael Whiteman, and I'm an international restaurant consultant. And um, they only invite me here once a year because they can't stand all my opinions. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, I'm happy this year. I feel like we were kind of slipping into the trend show to, like, March, where you could, like, dis, you know, prove or disprove. But now it's, like, full on, like, it's December. Now we're going to, you know. We're going to call some stuff. We're going to call some stuff. We're, we're going to make ca- some calls it like who sees it. Okay, but, it, you know, now that we're doing it before the end of the year, I don't have to be responsible for it. No, that's you're completely absolved. Yes. And Julia, welcome. Yes, hi. Julia Bainbridge, food editor at Yahoo Food. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> so I think we're going to pick up where we left off last week uh, with um, Michelle from Cover and talk about what is a very apparent and glowing trend <laughs> at restaurants, and that's technology at restaurants. Why are you shaking your head? Screens glow. Screens glow. Um, so, Michael, uh, t- no longer flavors, no longer analog, completely digital in restaurants. What's the trend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, restaurants have been ab- absorbing technology for years, but um, mostly it's been invisible. Uh, but what's interesting to me now is that it's it's turning around and facing the customer. So, uh, all of the fast food chains are scrambling to get customers involved in the ordering system and giving them options by throwing iPads at them and putting kiosks into their stores so you don't have to talk to people. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it depersonalizes the whole it, it, experience. It, it depersonalizes the whole experience. On the other hand, uh, if you've walked up to a, a Burger King in Midtown Manhattan recently and waited for somebody to say uh, good afternoon, uh, you may you as well. Want a <laughs> you, you, you don't want the personal experience. So it's, yeah, it depends on the restaurant. It I depends. Guess, on, I mean, we, yeah. I was at Del Posto last night, and the wine list was an iPad. Didn't love it. Oh, it's hateful. Mm-hmm. It's like, hateful. I just I don't know but, what it was. It but was, so is it at a at a certain level that the benefits of technology don't uh, outweigh the the loss of personal touch? Well, the information that you receive when you're looking at a series of printed pages comes to your brain differently than when you're trying to shuffle pages on an iPad because uh, you can't remember what you saw. Yeah, because, right. like, I mean, uh, the wine list, I mean, it was stunning. It was beautiful. It was so rich and so deep, and I understand the that they could update it and everything sunk. And you yeah, know, that's, that's good for them, but it's good not for good them. for you. But, you know, sometimes like, you put your, like, your thumb in a page, you're like, okay, that's the bottle of wine that I want, and you flip a few more. We're saying this yeah. now, but, I mean, do you read the newspaper ever? Like ink on your fingers kind of thing? I mean, we'll see how Sundays. you feel about it. Yeah, Sundays. Sundays. Yeah, but a newspaper isn't a series of lists. Yeah. Yeah, it's and I, but I also, I mean, I think it's I arguable. <laughs> <laughs> depending on which newspapers you're reading, I mean, my, my newspaper. I mean, I, I guess, I guess, I guess it's different. Like, I remember the sandwich place we grew up going to, Wawa. I remember when they switched over to having where you could just order your sandwich; it came out and always came out perfect. Which is the risk that you ran sometimes when you order from a person and it didn't come out exactly what you wanted. Right. I mean, it's a, for places like Panera, right? So their chief executive spent like. 40 million some dollars on um, mobile and kiosk ordering technology yeah. for this whole thing. And like, that makes sense for Panera. People are going there to get their lunches from work. It's a newer, cleaner system when before it was getting backed up and people were late and that kind of thing. But that surprises me at Del Posto because there you're, you're, you're sitting, your, you know, encrusting yourself in the seat for like five hours. I'm not to... going to lie. I was, because the, I was surprised that they handed me an iPad. Mm. I mean, well, yeah, it, but think of the paper they save. Oh my God. I mean, that list is that's like. That's a whole nother. Yeah, that's worth mentioning. But I mean, you can I'm still being, have. I'm, I'm being facetious. No, no, <laughs> but, but, well, but, but but I mean, but someone could still take you through, take you through it. Oh no, they did. The sommelier was great, but it was just like it was very. Uh, and I guess this is just more of the, um, you know, when you go to any high end restaurant and you don't get the tradition, which is the leather bound, beautiful, hard weighted paper, you start to think like, okay, things are changing. And yeah. that was more of my thought than it being anything else. But 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 the way when wine lists are organized is yeah. also changing. Yeah. So uh, you may go to a restaurant, an old-fashioned restaurant, and it's and it's organized by country and then by yeah. wine varietal. Or you may go to a newfangled restaurant, and it's ordered by whether it's fruity and juicy and sweet and fruit-forward and big. Um, and 
so when you now get another uh, monkey wrench hurled at you, which is this iPad, um, how do I navigate? Yeah. But it's going to happen to all the servers who these tablets might replace yeah, ultimately. But, but again, I, I still think that, like, um, and you talk about like the rise of fast cash, like, I still think that it's it's only going to ever be, and I, I could be wrong, but, like, to a certain point, you can replace people, but those are restaurants that, but, like, Honestly, if I went to a restaurant, you mentioned like some waiter wearing Google Glass that will like face recognize. I don't think I would. I mean, this is so lame. I'd be like right. so bummed if if uh, like it got to that point. Well, uh, if uh, if if you were to look uh, at the technology behind the photographs at Obama's um, recent inauguration, his last inauguration, I think it is, uh, you will find uh, in those photographs that you can perpetually enlarge them. Uh, oh yeah, and 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 you can tell one person from another in the crowd, uh, no matter where they're sitting, and uh, face recognition software will tell you who they are and where they came from, and if you can do that for an, or- an inauguration, you can do that for a, uh, a cocktail lounge and know that kills that, flirting, I, 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 yeah. kills flirting, <laughs> kills flirting. Yeah. And, and 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 you know that uh, Julia drinks vodka and tonic, but yeah, I but, mean, but she doesn't want any lime in it. But but I mean, I get, I don't know the, and and maybe I. This is like not even old school because I'm not that old, but it's like there's just something about this seems like well then anyone can put that glass on at any level and without any relationship and just know all these things about you and that's like it's an odd thing. You I want would, you it's like, an odd way to live. It's like now okay, so now I know this guy was married once before and you know there are Facebook photos I can access of him and his kids. Oh, I don't you know yeah, and, and it like takes away the and whole he likes his burgers dance medium rare. Of, but but that's talking you know, to each but, other. But the, the restaurant application of that is just, right. just tangential to the technology. No, of course. Uh, what you're saying is, you know, you can meet somebody on the street and know everything about them. So let me so let me ask you, Michael. But doesn't everyone that, like that uh, mystique of the bartender that knows a thousand people when they walk in yeah. the bar? Let me ask you this: when, you, as from your from a consulting angle, and you know, an owner comes to you and like talks about technology. What benefits do you sell them on, or like what are they, or what are some of the more common questions they're asking for for technology integration? Uh, d- let me turn the question around. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I, I, I checked into a Four Seasons hotel, uh, and uh, the reason I was there was because I couldn't get in the night before, and I had to stay at a Sheraton. And uh, so I moved my bags from uh, point A to point B on checking into the Four Seasons hotel, and the clerk who doesn't know me from Adam says, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Whiteman. I'm sorry we couldn't take you last night. I hope you had a good stay at the Sheraton. Wow. And um, I'll take your bags, and uh, they'll be in your room, which is not ready yet, but I know you have a meeting, and blah, 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 blah. So he knew all of that because it was on a computer in front of him, mm-hmm. and he was basically reading a script, and it was it was clear to me he was reading a script, even though it was nice to be recognized by somebody right. who didn't know me. Right, right. Uh, uh, so all we're doing now is, is uh, taking that technologically forward uh, so that he doesn't have to go in, into a computer screen and look at it. He just sees me walking up to the desk and uh, on his uh, Google Glass it says uh, that's, White- that's Michael Whiteman. Right. And that's a good application but I guess th- all this stuff is new and so we're figuring out where are the good applications and where are the bad, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. um, and I wonder, like, I don't know have who's going to be the judge of all that. Have you seen one though, Julie, that you no. seem to like? No. Okay, but, <laughs> but you know, if you have a party of twelve people, the waiter would uh, automatically would know who the host or hostess is of the party, who's throwing it, and who the other guests are, uh, and uh, it, it 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 makes a a a, a great social uh, easement of the whole process. But then, what makes? I mean, I guess there are, there are many other things that make a good waiter, but part of you know what I I tip for and what I recognize in a good waiter or server is knowing all this stuff him or herself. Let's talk about tipping because one of your trends is the death of tipping, which I think also bleeds into the technology section. So with the rise of the ticketing services out of Chicago and the rise of cover, it's like, and the rise of minimum wage, it seems like tipping could potentially disappear. Disappear. Do you, is that like something that you feel is a year from now, five years from now, or some mix of like certain restaurants will adopt that others won't? It, it's not a year from now, but you know, if you'd asked me that five years ago, I would have said, uh, uh, "Ask me again in five years," and I'll say, "Ask me again in five years." Right. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, it, it's happening, and uh, things like this start slowly, and then they happen all at once. Uh, the The issue of, of of tipping is that in this country, 
the there are now two classes of people working in restaurants. There are the tip people and the non-tip people. The tip people are the ones you see in the front of the house, and they're well dressed, and they speak well, and they know the menu, and and you know you know who they are. Uh, the anonymous ones are the grunts in the back of the house who work four times harder, um, don't speak English well, uh, may be illegal, uh, and uh, are based on their wages being exploited compared to the people in the front. Uh, this uh, could verge into a racial issue. Hmm. And if it verges into a racial issue, then the restaurant industry has real trouble. Right. right. So the idea of abol- abolishing tipping and uh, either raising prices or putting the tip into the price means that you can redistribute who gets the tips and try to balance out a bit the difference between the front of the house earnings and the back of the house earnings, which are, have a ratio of, I don't know, six or seven to one. So, I mean, if you, hmm. Interesting. So the idea, the concept, like, yes, it costs, the numbers are higher on the menu, but that's it. Like, it's kind of like uh, you what you see is what you get. Even if, like, tax could be folded into the prices as well, you can do the math at the table and just know, you know, exactly what it's going to be at the end of the meal. It's not any different than in Europe. Right. No, I mean, that's the thing. Tipping has been abolished in a majority of places all over the world. Is that stated really clear? So I haven't been to one of the restaurants that's doing the ticketing thing. Is that stated really clearly that that's your one price yeah. and there's no tip? Because another thing about tipping is that now that you have places where you do and places where you don't, people are more confused about an already confusing to- so, topic of etiquette. So you for, know? Like next sort of in a, like... for next and Alinea, I think outside of booze, it's all folded in. Like you buy your ticket and like t- service mm-hmm. gratuity in the meal is in. And you can just sell... So it is, but it's very clear. Like that's all in. If you want to tip more, and that's your prerogative, that's fine. Right. It, it, it's right. not. It's not quite as simple as that. When you're buying the ticket, uh, you're buying the ticket for your food, basically, and for the privilege of having a table. But now you're ordering wine and all the rest of the yeah. stuff. Yeah, or you're but, scalping it. Yes, but on top. But on top of that, uh, the tip is is generally included. Yeah, mm-hmm. outside of wine or any add-ons that you have. Yeah, right. but then you yeah. want to tipping on the wine. No, no, like no. It, it'll your, your your bill will have the tip included. Oh, now. okay. Okay. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about prepaying for tables and things like that? I'm not a I'm not a fan. Uh, I'm not a fan because uh, we uh, are all pissed off about having to deal with uh, that situation with airlines and hotels, mm, uh, right. specifically with airlines, uh, where uh, you know you, you buy a ticket, it's non-refundable. Uh, and hello, goodbye, too bad, you can't make it, well, you lose your table. Right. It's a little anti-hospitality. Yeah. You know, it's like, then it, it sort of alienates um, diners from going to the restaurant who, you know, didn't get a ticket. It's sort of like that whole walk-up thing or yeah, getting I, reservations. It's, yeah, I only it's, want uh, to buy dinner. I don't want to put a down payment on my house. But right. I mean, but I, th- I mean, just to, to counter that, it's like, yeah. I mean, airlines, like, you have to buy a ticket and you have to v- plan very far in advance to do that. With like with food, like if you don't want to eat there and you want to roll the dice, you can absolutely just try to try your hand. And it's not like you. Ne- I feel like you need airlines. Like that is like a mode of transportation you need to get from point A from point B. If you don't really want to eat somewhere or you don't like that system, there's just so many other options that you can go to. That's that's true. What I'm what I'm referring to is not a, a question of necessity. What I'm referring to is how you treat a customer, and and how the customer ends up feeling about the experience. And nobody's ever bought an airline ticket and felt good about it. Uh, <laughs> I, feel good, I feel good about what's about to happen. I feel real good. Um, but do you think so that with these ticketing systems and these technology, which is all sort of happening at in these high places, like that's what's giving rise to like the fast casual, something that's giving people good good food, but not these commitments where you have to spend five hundred dollars before you walk in the door. You're getting a giant iPad, or like you're dealing with all these tipping no tip. Like these more low entry points for good food, and that's why some of these chefs are moving away from these like high end four star restaurants and opening these easier access points. Uh, chefs are abandoning the high end uh, restaurants because uh, even though we're in a boom town, yeah, uh, taking New York, uh, there's still a ferocious amount of competition here. Yeah, and the costs of operating a, a first class restaurant in New York is staggering. Uh, and so, yeah, if can you, you have, can you give us an idea of the numbers? No, I can't give you an idea of a number, but I can tell you if you have two Michelin stars, yeah, and uh, or three. Let's take three. Sure. Um, you can't go any higher than three. Right. So now you spend the rest of your life worrying you're going to lose a star because God help you if you lose a star. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so in order to maintain that store, you now have huge costs attached to it. The flowers, the linens, the uniforms, all the stuff that has nothing to do with the food because the third store doesn't have to do with the food. It has to right. do with the service and the atmosphere. So you're now obliged uh, at great cost to maintain all of that stuff. Um, and uh, if you now look at the way people are spending money, especially uh, millennials, uh, you say to yourself, I don't need the linen, I don't need the flowers, I don't need the reservationist, I don't need the reservation system, I don't need open table, and I don't need all of that other stuff. Um, and uh, that's a... And I don't have to spend all that money building a restaurant. A smart thing from the restaurateur's perspective is, um, I was telling you guys about Suvla in San Francisco. Is mm-hmm. there recently? And um, Charles Belilis, who's the chef and owner, he he calls what he's doing smart casual. So it's like one step above fast casual, and it's like, <laughs> oh my there. god! Well, but so like, hear me out. Right, so no, it's I'm like, not, yeah. um, you order at the counter, you take your food to your table, but there's booze. The decor is nice. Um, it's they're not sourcing their food well. It's not, it's not waiter service. It's not like you it's order not waiter there. service. Okay, okay. Um, so it's ki- he's kind of straddling the fence there, and and it's like I, he used the um, litmus test of like would people come here on a date? Like, mm. and you would. It's it's well designed, yeah, um, and all that stuff. But it's still relatively <laughs> affordable. Um, I don't know. I think he's he's on to something there. Would you? Would Whether you? you like the terminology or not? Yeah. <laughs> would you go there on a date? I would. I think it's kind of perfect because it's not um, too first, showy and expensive, and it's not too down market. First date, though, right? For, perfect first date. Perfect for first date because yeah. when you go on a date date, you want to like sort of tuck in, right? I mean, well, it depends maybe. on who's trying yeah. to impress. Yeah. 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 It depends on who's doing the impressing. But so, Michael, so who are some of the chefs that are opening up these fast casual places and, and turning not their backs but diversifying their portfolio? Uh, Jose Andres in Washington uh, is doing it. Um, Bradley Ogden in uh, San Francisco is open to uh, casual places in uh, Houston, I think it is, or somewhere in Texas. It's a big place, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, there there are any number of them. They're not they're just not coming up on my mental screen, but uh, screen at the moment. Uh, but uh, they're all putting their uh, their names on the line and saying that they can compete with uh, Chipotle Grill or, uh, as you said before, uh, Julia, about uh, Panera Bread. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can enter that market uh, and, A, theoretically think they're doing a, a better job and trying to prove it, and, B, hanging their names on the front of the door is a reason why people will come. And are, are, are these restaurants just like their, like, you know, their first Shake Shack where they, they think that they're going to be able to turn these into chains? I mean, that, but isn't he the king of it? That's, that's, the, that's, that, that's, that's the, the example. Yeah. I mean, Daniel, I mean... No, but I'm, no, but yeah. I'm saying like they're starting these restaurants not just to equally abandon Four Star, but to also be like, okay, I want my Shake Shack. I, th- I think it's too. Yeah, I, I want my Shake Shack not because I want to have one of them, but because um, I'm never going to be able to do an IPO on my three store restaurant. Right. You're also turning. I mean, it, let's say if you had a 40 seat restaurant in something in the fast casual concept that's open all day long, you can do like 500, 600 covers with that amount of seats. So uh, and things and no no shows. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Can you imagine having to buy tickets for uh, Shake Shack Burger? <laughs> People would do it. No, there would be tourists. Would there would be it. tourists who would be like, "I will buy my one fifteen p.m. burger." People would have done that for the um, Cronut. Uh, People would have absolutely done that for the Cronut. Uh, boys right. and boys and girls, uh, the the places like Starbucks, yeah. uh, the big pizza chains, uh, and uh, a, a lot of the fast uh, food chains uh, now let you do mobile ordering. Uh, so if you're on the highway, you place your order, and it's ready for pickup when you get there. That's so awesome. Can you imagine walking to Starbucks and having a coffee and just going right back but I mean, But hold on a second. But yes, because their their whole thing is about pushing as much pizza as possible. The Cronut, though, or I mean, I guess Shake Shack is in the Cronut was just for that example. Like li- They limited the amount, right? Mm-hmm. So you could like essentially have a black market. Well, there was already a black market for Cronuts, but <laughs> to get your like... 7.30 a.m. reservation without having to wait in line. Uh, yeah, you're talking about those hot ticket food yeah. items, yeah. not right. your everyday sandwich. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right, we're going to play. take a quick break. We will be right back.
by angels I'm at peace Baby, when you're close Heaven knows You are my sunshine My jolie I need you to know Girl, I love you so Oh, my words Oh, my words can't describe my jolie How I feel about you feebly I'll try to show you jolie feel It just overflows Girl, I love you so They say love ain't easy It comes and goes like a tidal flow Oh, my Julie, you swept me in your undertow Girl, I never let you go you fall eternity is how long I love you don't you know I would never leave you girl I love you so they say love Ain't easy It comes and goes Like a tidal flow Oh my Julie You swept me in your undertow Girl I never let you go are talking trends with Michael and Julia and uh, Mr. Gregory B. here in the last last episode of 2014. Um, so this year, I would say Flavors had a big showing, and next year Flavors will also be big. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about like the science of flavors and and um, neurogastronomy, neurogastronomy, and how people embellish flavors. Um, Michael, why don't you tell people what that means for those who don't? Well, you know. Biotechnologists and neurotechnologists have been uh, probing into our brains to understand how we react to certain things, um, mostly in sex, but I, it's managed to spread to food. Uh, Those are related? Yeah. The <laughs> yeah, well, kind of. You guys all know that Seinfeld episode with George and the pastrami and sex, right? <laughs> classic. Classic. That was the very first study of that trend. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the issue is... Uh, they're now trying to discover what uh, makes your neurons fire and uh, and what the the psychology and the neuropsychology is about your uh, discovering what you like about food and uh, what motivates you to eat and drink certain foods uh, and what makes certain foods pleasurable. So uh, it used to be called psychotasting. Now it's neurogastronomy. Uh, 
there's been really very serious research uh, into the field with a, with a lot of testing. Uh, and so they, they've discovered, for example, that um, if you drink uh, your favorite single malt scotch in a room that has uh, uh, a lot of greenery and grass around it, uh, the scotch will taste grassier. Uh, if you turn the lights red, up red, and get rid of the grass, uh, the scotch will taste sweeter. Have you experienced any of this? I have not. But, I, that, but then I don't like scotch. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I mean, but we talked about this, I think, last year, maybe two years ago, about the rest of the chefs who were having certain music piped in, visuals on the wall, and, and, and different things that are really, you know, going with the senses to enhance the food. Correct. Those are, but they're, they're two separate things. Right. The, the Vegasization of restaurants yeah, no, yeah. pumping sense everywhere. The people we were talking about last year are putting you in a room where they're controlling the entire environment. They're right. piping in music and sounds and smells. Uh, vibrations, they're changing temperatures and lighting. Um, and w- what they're doing is uh, controlling the total experience of your meal. Mm-hmm. So it's not just food, it's a, it's a complete experience. The, the neurogastronomy guys uh, are, are interested in that for sure, but they want to probe into your head to see what's really going on there. Uh, so one, one, is, um, one is experimentation for the hell of it, uh, and the other is really quite scientific. Uh, so w- when they uh, when they discover uh, that strawberries taste sweeter on a round plate than they do on a square plate for reasons I can't explain, <laughs> but uh, that uh, that's part of the science of now figuring out what to do next when you want to please a customer. Can we talk briefly about the aroma fork? <laughs> um, which might be the most. Let's talk. Let's about talk about the aroma, the aroma fork. fork. Is it this year's? Must buy gift. Uh, it's it's a gift that I will try to avoid. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, the the aroma fork is a, is a manifestation of what I really find repulsive about the the, <laughs> uh, the manufactured food industry, not not the restaurant industry, uh, where they're never able to leave well enough alone. And they keep on overlaying flavors on top of flavors on top of flavors in order to get shelf space in the supermarket uh, and in order to somehow to tempt you to buy it. Uh, and I guess the ba- best example of that uh, is uh, there's a category called rehydration. Uh, rehydration is something we used to call water. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it's not just water anymore. If you go to the supermarket, you will find waters in 18 different flavors, not one of which uh, is... Um, natural uh, it, it's a product of some scientific technology or if it's a natural flavor it's something that tastes like strawberry but isn't really strawberry mm. um, I'm, 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 I, 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 th- I think it corrupts the palate uh, but we are in, a, in a, an era where uh, it's now called ready to drink water because it's, right. it's got a flavor attached to it. Well, it's also I mean, like if you don't like a certain food, the way it tastes, just leave it alone. For those who don't know, the aroma fork is, it's this, you can put a scent into the handle, right? And it turns something that you might, a correct. food that you might not like, like lots of people don't like cilantro, into something that tastes good to you. Yeah, yeah. But, it, um, but, but that's, but, that's but, just but, your body reacting to something that they don't want. Right. It's, cilantro it's, is a particular example because yeah. people inherit this. Yeah. It, it's either masking something or it's, or it's over-exaggerating. Over exagger- over Can't be a word like that. They're either, <laughs> they're, it's either enhancing something or it's, or it's uh, exaggerating something uh, or it's masking something. And But it, in, in all of those cases, it's really corrupting the fundamental flavor of what you should be eating in the first place. And when you say like corrupting your palate, it just means that like you can't trust your taste buds anymore or just in, in what sense? It's it's moving your taste buds, and uh, here we are back in, in your brain again, yeah. uh, and the way your brain is wired uh, to uh, begin to crave uh, the exaggerated artificial flavor mm-hmm. uh, of something. Uh, you know, there are a lot of kids who can't stand fresh orange juice because it doesn't taste like uh, the stuff from the from the cardboard carton. That blows my mind. My mind just keeps going to that. It's just so decadent. I don't know. If you don't like it, then you don't eat that thing. You eat something else. That's a what a policy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. But one of one of the actually two of the big food manufacturers now have um, a little uh, gizmo that you can put in your purse uh, that has uh, flavors in it, 
So uh, you can, if you go to a restaurant and you order a Perrier and you want it to taste like um, blueberries, you just put some drops of blueberries in it. Can I admit, I did give my, my dad is a big hunter and uh, so, you know, he camps out when he's hunting and so he chews on, um, what are they? Jerky. The little wooden sticks. No. Um, the licorice fruit? No, well, no, he just chews on, you know, like little wooden Tooth sticks picks? people use. Toothpicks, yes. Toothpicks. He chews on toothpicks. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. Oh, that new so technology? I did, yeah. I did give him bourbon flavored toothpicks. Oh, that's nice. Because I, like that. I don't think that, like, pulpy wood is well, like, that be- pleasurable to most it's people. It's better than toothpick flavored bourbon. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it is. Very but, woody. But, but, he, they, but you, Julia, you just gave a great example because, uh, you know, bourbon is uh, a defined drink, a great American whiskey. Uh, and it's it's being mucked around with, uh, so now you can get the biggest seller this year is bourbon flavored with honey. Um, or that or fi- bacon, or fire. Honey. But wait, that's about the, yeah, fire. Ugh. Okay, but that's you know bourbon flavored with honey is not enough. So now you can get it flavored with honey and cinnamon or honey and chili peppers. All that says to me is you don't actually like bourbon. That's yes, correct. That is correct. What was that thing called? Like shots or spikes or whatever that was you would drop it. Oh yeah, it was marketed. It was they banned it very quickly. It was for. Uh, it was very thinly marketed at underage drinkers who didn't enjoy the taste of booze, and you could like squ- squirt something into the booze to cover the flavor. But the FDA was like, "It was very ahead of its time." Yeah, very ahead of its time. <laughs> wait, but we, wait. Let's talk about brown brown uh, spirits. Wait, wait. Hold on. Before we get to wait, spirits, we, no. Let's see because I want to talk. Okay, about, you got you guys sorted out. Yeah. We'll, we'll hold just on. sit here. No, because because we're, we're while we're on the trend, can we just talk about the crazy flavors that happened this year, mainly in the realm of potato chips and other like as you said of like layering. Flavor on top of flavor on top of oh, yeah. flavor to the point where I, I go to the store and it looks like madness. It looks like Willy Wonka, like crazy combinations. Just to give you a few that you listed in your trend report Lay's hot and sour fish soup potato chips, um, shrimp and mayonnaise or avocado and cheese Doritos. Oh, wait, but those are from Japan, remember? Yes, that's fine. But I think I've seen Cap- ca- cappuccino, cappuccino. Yes. Ca- yes. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Yes. Bacon and maple syrup, yep. which isn't. Terrible, but it's still really weird. Wasabi uh, ginger. Was wasabi really ginger. Um, and then I think uh, my favorite is the anchovy garlic chips. <laughs> Last year there was a chicken and waffles. A lot it's of really, these are coming from the Lay's yeah. competitions, right? So they're op- getting consumers to it's, try out to get the next Lay's flavor. It's, um, look, not, nothing can be spicy enough and nothing can be uh, flavored strongly enough for the American consumer, especially in the snack aisle. Uh, we call it four S's and a B. Which means? Which means that the manufacturers are making things in various combination or throwing it all on together of sweet, salty, spicy, smoky, and bitter. Mm. And uh, so uh, many of the flavors that you just uh, recited are, are combinations of those. And, and they're not necessarily harmonious flavors. Sometimes they're on purpose clashing flavors. I mean, I will say... And that's a marketing thing, or they're on purpose clashing a, flavors because no, be, it's somehow be, ultimately pleasurable? No, because we need more taste thrills and mm. things that clash in the mouth. My tongue uh, is bored. I need more thrills. <laughs> yeah, well, things that, you know, there we are in neurogastronomy again. The things that clash in your mouth make your brain light up. I mean, I, there has to be some... Have you, have you any of you experimented with any of these flavors? I mean, they actually taste like... Terrible. I mean, yes, terrible, but they do actually taste like what they represent. Which well, is terrifying. We did have um, Oliver Strand, who's a coffee expert, review yeah. cappuccino chips for Lay's. Um, and I'll tell you what he said. He said, the chips smell like the coffee candy your grandmother kept in a glass bowl mm. in the living room. They have a dusty flavor that coats your mouth before settling into a bitter aftertaste that gets in the way of what a potato chip is supposed to do, namely make you want to cradle the bag and not share. So I don't <laughs> think that was a successful endeavor, at no, least no. according to Oliver. I have some of my chips, but said <laughs> no one ever until these bags. I'm good. Um, but yeah, I feel that, um, you know, that those flavors, I think... Uh, and you have a whole section in this um, that is the beyond section, and this is really like the beyond flavor. But in a lot of other categories, um, you know, th- condiments and different ingredients beyond kale. Can you talk about some of the the, the ingredients and the flavors that we're we'll seeing next year that aren't as uh, Frankenstein-y, horrendous, terrifying, nightmarish as these? You mean things that it's possible to eat? Yeah. Yes, things that things that are popping up next year that you go, oh, I actually want that. Mm-hmm. Uh, chefs, oh, I'm not 
staying with restaurants now. Let's I'm, do it. I'm, I'm through, be, three beating up, through beating up on the manufacturers. I, f- I, feel like, I feel like every year we come in and we say, we love you chefs and manufacturers. You guys are losing your minds. Well, then you can do that because you're not sponsored by Heinz or Kraft or Campbell Soup. No, we are not. No. Which is why you're poor. We're sponsored by Shake Shack. Thank you, Danny Myers. For- <laughs> <laughs> but I think as far as chefs go, though, we are loving chefs without huge names, right? I think that's something we'll go towards. I don't know if there's research to back this up, but basically, I mean, you have Andrew Knowlton, who chose Rose's Luxury in Washington, D.C. as the best new restaurant right. this year. Um, you have, uh, like, Ned Elliott at Foreign and Domestic, who throws this little indie chef's week every week to to promote kind of lesser-known chefs who deserve, a, um, deserve some attention. Um, and I, Yahoo was part of um, this year's in Costa Mesa, and I just found, like, some great chefs I hadn't heard of, like Ian Bowden at Shake Shack. At Shake, not Shake Shack, at the Shack. The oh, Shack. Do we get our three mentions in? We got, we got our three mentions <laughs> in. Okay. We're good out there, Liz. Great. Yeah. Okay. And James Mark of North in Providence, Rhode Island. There, all, these, all this great talent tucked away, and I think they're getting more and more attention. Um, uh, they are uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, I, th- I think the people who are doing all the writing on all the blogs are, are, have exhausted themselves on the, the brand names. <laughs> on Chang, because you know, every you know every one of the blogs uh, speaks about the same ten chefs. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's time to move beyond that. Uh, another example of, uh, similar to what you just gave is uh, Josh Ozersky, oh, yeah. uh, who did the the best new restaurants uh, for Esquire. Um, and they were primarily places you'd never heard of unless you happen to live near them. And you talk about that too, and like some of in, in some of the things to look for next year, which is like local wines and like a local chauvin, like chauvinism, or just like a local pride as well. You know, kind of just being like, yeah, this is our guy. That you know, it's a restaurant maybe too, and you know, who's better than our guy? Well, various states have relaxed their liquor laws uh, and uh, have changed the way they tax uh, production of liquor. Uh, so they've made it possible for people to start small spirits breweries and and, uh, and craft beer breweries, as you know. Uh, and so uh, uh, New, uh, New York is, is full of people making artisan bourbon and artisan uh, smoked whiskey and artisan gin. And, and we, of course, of course, we know all about artisan beers. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're fairly local. Uh, and they're allowing restaurants to... Uh, make a connection, a regional connection between where they are and where the food and the booze comes from. I mean, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things that uh, millennials, like, I don't know if we fall into that category for it, too. Technically, we do. But technically, I don't probably feel that on, way. The cusp of, on the cusp of it. Speak for yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, yeah. But they talk about spending money not on material things, but on experiences. So, you know, we're, uh, where I work, we opened a hotel in a city that's not that well established. All their top 10 lists are totally wrong. And when we would go out there, we would have bad, kind of like bad tourist days when we were learning it. Mm-hmm. But the days that were good, where we would find that hidden gem that had like a local spirit and everything, we were like, this is incredible. And like, you have to be here. So I imagine that like the rise of like a local no, no name, quote unquote, no name chef with, that has like local brewery that you've never heard of that like creates a more authentic experience when you're there only just, you know, gives that place more impact. Well, when you if, if you go to Europe, if, I mean, if you're eating dinner in Italy, uh, unless you're in a place with fancy tablecloths, uh, you just tell them you want red, white, or white wine. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and wine appears because you know it'll be local. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, that same thing is being applied here. Uh, and on top of that, people are motivated to order things where they know where the food came from. Uh, Montana, I just looked this up for a project we're working on. Montana has 20 places brewing local beer. Mm. So if if you take a if you take a state where not a lot of people live, I was going to say what's the per capita on that? I don't know, but if you, but if that's an example, then it tells you uh, when you get to a state like New York, uh, where we have dozens and dozens of, of wineries, but on top of that, people making the equivalent of bourbon and scotch and gin, and pretty good. I mean, it's nice to see that bourbon is now. I think, and maybe that's because. Um, the artisanal local trend of brewing has been in existence long enough for those local bourbons to mature that you're seeing that now that is overtaking vodka as the number one spirit in yep. America because people want that sort of heavier, more flavorful, more round stuff than... I mean, every time I, every time I see a new vodka and they're like, master craft distilled, I go, absolutely not. I go, <laughs> easy to get to market very quickly. 
Well, yeah, well, and you have some, uh, I think it was Canlis out in Seattle, like didn't even serve vodka on their menu, which that's a, that's a level of snobbery. That there is like anti-hospitality. I get that not a lot of people who who are into sort of poached cocktails and I guess a lot of people who believe they have taste say they don't like vodka, but there's a there's a place for it on the bar along with other well, things. Well, it, 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 it's, um, it's not the vodka itself that uh, Canlis found of, uh, offensive. Uh, the same with white Zinfandel. Uh, no, the, uh, the, the problem with vodka is that uh, it was meant to be a neutral spirit with which you used as a mixer. Well, so uh, they could they could provide an example of how it's meant to be enjoyed, not eradicate it from the okay, menu. Okay, but now you have 58 th- or 60 different flavors of vodka, all of them artificial. Right. Um, and, and it goes back to what we were saying before. Uh, <laughs> somebody has amplified... Uh, birthday cake vodka. Yeah, birthday cake vodka. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, from the point of view of the bartender, I now got uh, 30 bottles of vodka on the bar when I only have five bottles of gin. But also in restaurant owners, you know, when you're cutting your, your bar deals, they're like, well, you got to take these 10 other categories and we'll give you X amount of dollars. And you're just like, I'll never sell that inventory. Like, there's no one, there's not enough people in the world who are going to come in order to get me through a bottle of, birth, of birthday cake vodka in a, a week, right. let alone a year. So it just takes up shelf space. Actually, there's, a, there's an interesting parallel to what you say. What you say is true. Uh, but I, I was just thinking of the bottles that, uh, when I was younger, uh, used to gather dust in my father's and my <laughs> grandfather's uh, liquor cabinet uh, that are, and, and on the backs of bars that are now moving to the front. Uh, uh, things like chartreuse, uh, amaros, and uh, all, kinds all the, of all the amari, things, yeah. the bitter things, uh, Campari, com- uh, Campari, yes. Uh, I mean, Negroni, maybe second year in a row, the, the new drink. Yes. I, I, I think it's just nowness.com. Uh, literally, their last video they put up this year was just like a behind the scenes thing on Negroni. It's just like a whole beautifully shot thing. It on was just, beautiful. Yeah. But, but a Negroni uh, has bitter. Yeah, it, it comes. The, the sweet vermouth is bitter. Yeah, but it's also sweet, yeah. and then it's got bitters on top of that, and then it's got the the booze attached that to packs it. Packs a hell of a punch. So, oh. Yeah, so you know, it's 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 touching all the bases that we were talking about I earlier. Mean, London has like I feel like that is now the adopted drink of like millennials and hipsters is Negronis. I've never had so many Negronis and watch people just like put them down like it was nothing I mean they go they go down in a way that it's just like oh there's no booze in these <laughs> there's no booze tell me that tomorrow tell me that the next day let's go drink some Negronis after this okay but, we got to... but the interesting the, the interesting thing about about Negronis to me is is the bitter component because uh, uh, people accepting bitter as a maturation of, of taste in, in this country and that's beyond just booze. You see that in um, fermented things. You see that in bitter greens. I mean, it's much more on the menus yep. than it was five years ago. But and that, ago. but that, I mean, also speaks to your point that, and I mean, this could be a little bit of a leap, but the way in which the more manufactured good has pushed our taste buds, it maybe opens it up to be able to receive Mother Nature. So Lay's is doing good work to open up our taste buds? <laughs> yeah, that's not that's how we're ending That's what I heard. That's not that's how what I heard. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. 2014 has been great. Greg, what a terrible... No, but do you know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, like, the way in which that, like, you are people experimenting with new flavors that now they're like, okay, I can, like, taste, like, a bitter green or, like, a Swiss chard and be like, oh, I'm, like, in... I'm, I'm now into this. The, here, There's an interesting dichotomy. I don't know. I mean, you, you're talking about mainly sweet like our kids are growing up our regular orange juice isn't satisfying enough because it doesn't have the added sucrose and whatever else is in there um but at the same time yeah you have this this uh, what's what's going on if you go back to what made starbucks really work uh was that they over roasted their coffee it was extremely bitter we all used to call it charbucks when we were joking about it right uh, and they and they and they roasted it that way so that it would hold its own when they poured all the steamed milk over it. So you would have a latte and this burnt coffee would somehow work its way through. Uh, we're now at the point where we're drinking a lot of espresso coffee, which Starbucks sells very little of. Uh, so there's a, a whole world out there drinking bitter uh, without the mediating requirement of the fatty dairy product. Hmm. Um, so I want to make sure that we have enough time to get the buzzwords, but oh, yeah. the the one thing that we uh, want to talk about was was toast. Oh, uh, <laughs> we got into it last week. We got into it last week, um, and it's funny because the uh, I was out at an event uh, last Saturday, 
and uh, was like, I was like, oh, I'm kind of hungry, and, and they had some food stands up there, and they had avocado toast, and uh, we realized that it was the same reference, and I was like, fuck this, I'm not paying seven fifty for it, and uh, it was the same reference point that you had in your trend point. And you could thank our favorite town in San Francisco for starting this toast trend. But look, if you have really beautiful no, bread, no, no, no. And lots of, I mean, talking like probably a whole avocado or three quarters of an avocado on there. I mean, that's a meal, though. That's a seven fifty dollar meal on like thick. That's what they. That's what they have led you to believe. I'm gonna, hold on, I'm going to say that avocado toast has been its own thing for years. Yes. Another example, please. Um, any kind of these are all just like tartine, right? I mean, they're all like things on toast. I'd pay, I pay three fifty for it, maybe. But, like, um, think about Blue Ribbon Bakery does all these little tartines. They have, like, a smoked fish on there with capers and oil. You mean crostinis? You mean canapes? Yeah, basically. No, but big ones. I mean, big, big pieces of toast that are... It's a, it's an open-faced sandwich. Yeah. I'd pay seven fifty for a if sandwich it, made oh, wait, 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 oh, 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 you just We just shifted from toast to, to an, an open-faced face. sandwich. No, that, but the toasts we're seeing are basically that. It's meals on... A, a bed of bread that is the vehicle for moving it to your mouth. My 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 wife, who's a consultant and author, Roseanne Gold, says that toast is really the successor to bruschetta, <laughs> yeah. um, which which may be so, uh, but uh, in most places you're really paying seven dollars and fifty cents for what used to be toast and jelly. Yeah, I think what look it's I, not though. But it's the, it's also the addition of like it's like four fifty for a bread basket. Well, bread's a whole nother. Oh. I mean, the, the bread itself is a whole nother thing. And so, I, you know, to go to Tartine in San Francisco and pay four bucks for like a beautiful loaf of bread, that's fine. But you also have bread courses. I mean, this is another show. I mean, I, I think <laughs> yeah, yes. we don't have, uh, I, I think we put this at the end because we didn't, I didn't want to just come to fisticuffs. But I think, I think the issue is more just the rebranding of toast is just sort of ridiculous. Well, you'll see the January uh, cover girl on Bon Appetit. Bon Appetit is, is coast, toast. toast. Is it really? Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. Um, so but it's delicious. Hot topic. I mean, I, here's, the <laughs> thing, here's the thing. I, I last night thought I would wanted to, after um, the bread and butter course at Del Posto, I was like, I wonder if I could get away with opening a bread and butter restaurant. We almost did once. Yeah? Yes. What, what stopped you? Um, Were the margins not good? No, um... Fortunately or not, the client died. Oh, oh. <laughs> not from. Wah, wah. 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 All right. So, by the way, the joke there should have been the margarine was not yeah, good. That's, yeah. Um, all right. So let's run through some of these bud wor- buzzwords. Well, first off, Greg and I, and thanks to our dad, have been on pistachios for years. Yeah. They are. They are pistachio ice cream, sorbet, the sor- sorbet girls, gourmet sorbet. Oh, but God, I'm blanking on them. Yeah. But they do a pistachio gelato that is. Mm. Mind-blowingly smooth and creamy. Pistachios were our holiday thing growing up. You just open yeah. them up, throw the shells into the fire, they crackle. There's a uh, whole a, ceremony. Oh, um, that's a nice tradition. So, here's what yeah. I, here's what I don't like: um, where you can get bags of already peeled pistachios. I feel like it takes away the whole experience. It does, just like peanut. Well, I guess some people don't like to crack open peanuts, but boiled peanuts. Un American, un American, I believe. Yeah, well, I yeah. was. I Spit was, the shells on the floor and. Throw back another yeah. pint. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't referring to the nut as the nut. I was referring to the nut as the way it's used. Oh, really? Uh, so I, 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 eating pistachios out of the shell is great, uh, but we're seeing chefs put them uh, on pizza, uh, grind, grinding them up to make pesto. Like a pesto, yeah, yeah. and that's another thing. Anything beyond basil and pesto, but sorry, that's not, oh, the, that's not in the buzzwords, <laughs> but I think everybody's making, you know, all sorts of different. This is ABP. Anything yeah. but pesto. <laughs> yeah. Anything but pesto. Um, the uh, no, but we're seeing them in uh, in Caesar salads. We're seeing them ground up mm. into sauces uh, as garniture for uh, fish. Uh, in much the way that you used to get uh, almonds on your sole, now you're getting fish with your sea bass. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I guess if you ground Garnishes, up, if, if you ground up uh, pistachios and then you put them in like shakers for pizza toppings, I'd be into that. Mm. Mm. Uh, you would be into it if I made a pesto. Yeah, you'd, li- yeah. you'd love it. Yeah, uh, Ros- Roseanne makes a, a pesto uh, with pistachios for her salmon. Uh, also, with all those Mediterranean flavors, and now that we yeah. have some of these great, healthy kind of uh, breakfast forward spots, like you have Squirrel in LA, and the, yeah. you know that you get your Greek yogurt with some pistachios, mm-hmm. maybe a little rose water, mm. or something, and like. 
Um, Figs. Uh, the upscaling of... By, by the way, I have to interrupt you. On top of that, there's been a shift uh, in the world in the last, uh, I don't know, 40 years uh, because all our pistachios used to come from Iran. Oh. Uh, they now come from California. Really? Uh, so there's, there's more of them and they're uh, cheaper. Well, that's what Steve Colbert's advertising, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, God, those commercials. R.I.P. Oh, what? yeah, he, yeah, the character passed away on Thursday. Yeah. Well, why is it false advertising? No, it's not false advertising. Just he's promoting American pistachios. P- pistachios. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so next buzzword is uh, the um, upscaling ever spicier ramen noodles, Japanese or cross-cultural. I mean, ramen, I don't, ever, I don't see the ramen thing dying anytime soon. It's, it's not, no, I don't see ramen dying at all. But, <laughs> but if, if you go out for ramen in Japan, uh, they're really very soothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dishes that tend toward the bland. Uh, it's only in this country that they can keep increasingly getting uh, spicier and spicier. I, yeah, I think there's confusion there, too, because a, a lot of people are going to Momofuku thinking, you know, Momofuku Noodle thinking this is like a representation of a classic yeah. ramen shop in Japan, which it's not, and which Chang never claimed it was. Right. You know, it's sort of his Korean-Japanese mashup with the flavors he liked. But I think because that he has made such this empire that's influenced the way the whole country eats, it's... Yeah. Maybe some misinformation. Tonkatsu yeah. con- congealed at room temp. But he's got this new cappuccino sriracha one that's coming out next year. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> and pistachio-flavored <laughs> vodka. pistachio <laughs> vodka. Um, Pimp's Cup is coming back. Another classic drink. Another one of those Did, things that, that sat on the back of the shelf. Didn't Saturday that already night. have... I felt like Pimp's Cup like eight years ago. Yeah, like, yeah had, it had did. Had a moment. It had a moment, but it's back. So why well, is it coming? Why is it now coming back? Uh, it, well, it's having another moment because uh, at some point you have to ransack the attic to find out uh, to find something new. Uh, in, what, do, what, do in, it, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got in the attic? Yeah, but in, 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 in addition to that, uh, you're seeing people drinking a large format uh, drinks in restaurants, like punches, so, like punches, and uh, Pim's cup. Pim's cup uh, makes a great punch, especially mm. if you put a lot of other stuff in. it. <laughs> And uh, uh, Nuja, did I get that right? Induya. Induya. No. Nailed it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sausage. hey. Which I had for the first time this year uh, just on two pieces of bread, mm. toasted oh. in Portland, and I was like, this is incredible. $12? $4. $4. Nice. $4. Well, I'm, I'm glad you had it this year because that makes us absolutely on trend. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. well, you guys are always ahead of us anyway, <laughs> so if you've had it, it must be but, good. Uh, but I never heard of it. It was one of those things like I'd never heard of it before, and they said they got it um, phoned in from Chicago from a local, like, uh, Italian uh, butcher in Chicago. And then once I saw it, it was one of those, like, then I just saw it everywhere. Okay, so let's explain what enduia yeah. is. Um, enduia is a spreadable sausage that's mm, made so uh, originally in Calabria, and it's made from all the leftover unmentionable parts of the pig after... Like, uh, it, like it's dirty secrets? Yeah. <laughs> like skeletons in the closet type yes, of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, is this, like, updated Scrapple? <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's 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 all the unmentionable parts of the pig that ground up with an enormous amount of garlic, and uh, you're in Calabria, so it's hot pepper, mm. uh, and it's put into a bladder, uh, and uh, you can spread it on anything you want to. But it, it's now being made in this country uh, with real parts of the pig and not <laughs> not the unmentionables. Right, yeah. Spanish uh, haggis, uh, and. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 spicy, uh, but it's got a memorable flavor. Uh, it's a little funky, uh, and, uh, and dark, I, right? It's yeah. darker than most. No, it's it's kind of no, it um, mahogany. Okay. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Um, it, it's not as dark as red salami. It's, okay. And uh, and it's fattier, which is why it spreads. Uh, uh, but it's so, so I, I've had it on pizza. I've had it on pasta. I've had it on. Uh, I've had it in sauces that are going on fish. Uh, because it's a it's a very sneaky, unidentifiable flavor. You know, last mm. night that was actually something that we had last night uh, was um, salmon with veal jus, and having fish beefed up by beef juice oh, juice, juice. <laughs> uh, was a flavor combination I never thought of before, and it was so insanely amazing. Oh, it's been that's been that's old stuff. That's old stuff. Yeah, I'm going to talk yeah. to your brother from now on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had a great year. Uh, we're going to end on that note. <laughs> we're going to end. We're going to end uh, because it is it is the sixth night of Hanukkah. We are going to end on um, the comeback of Jewish delis and Jewish mashups, um, a tradition that used to be so insane. Get a nice pastrami in every corner of New York, and now it sort of died, and now it's on its way back. 
And bagels, too. And there. bagels. And bagels, too. Well, that's part of the same phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Um, and the question is why? Beats me. <laughs> like borscht beets or just beets? No, just beats me. Oh, okay. <laughs> you love, you love why this trend more than any other Why night? this trend why tonight more than any other night? Uh, one of the reasons is um, that a lot, of, a lot of Israelis are moving to the United States mm. uh, because it's uh, it's a safe place to go to. Gotcha. And uh, Israel is in, in dangerous territory. Uh, so there, that that's one of the reasons. Uh, this is like the next frontier of comfort food that maybe people hadn't explored before who didn't grow up in New York. Or, but wasn't you know, there, Jewish, wasn't there like, like maybe like a few years ago, like uh, Kutcher's, when they opened up, there, there was like a few... Jewish, like refocused Jewish. There's been some starts and stops. Well, uh, Kutcher's was kind of a joke. Yeah, uh, and and when the when the joke stopped being funny, like they Borscht closed. Belt joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know when this, if if you have a one joke restaurant, when yeah. the joke stops being funny, the restaurant closes. Yeah. Yeah, it just wasn't good. But I mean, you know, when you really think about Jewish food, it's got all the the five flavors you mentioned before. Yeah. The four S's and the B. And it's just comforting, and it's just, you know, especially when you get into, it's and it can be as comforting as you need it to be, or as fresh and, and light as you need it to be. Well, the other is, I, I, I think people uh, have stopped being fatophobic, mm. uh, so they're willing to get a fatty piece of pastrami or corned beef and not feel guilty about it. Or as according to New York or Times, use schmaltz mm-hmm. as the new fat. Which that, is that too, and cheaper and, and more affordable. Yeah, and the, and the scientists are uh, divided on it, but a lot of them are saying that... Uh, Fat, a fat is good for you, and B uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do need fat to absorb the vitamins in food. So um, before we um, play our last song, let's uh, from our two experts. What are you hoping here. to see next year? No, I w- that's not the question. What are you most excited about? Oh. Isn't that's that the, no? It's more hopeful. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm most excited about eclecticism on. Uh, on menus, world like, on a world on a plate, which I believe was a trend from your, a few years ago. <laughs> yes, oh, it was. I'm a few years late, but I guess. Um, but in this sort of, you know, in the same sense that you go to a great little boutique where the owners have curated a selection of, you know, some kind of baby clothes and a book and a pad and a coat, um, and it all fits this certain aesthetic. You have a lot of chefs who aren't cooking, you know, food that is authentic to a certain region. It's food that's kind of authentic to their sense of taste and picking uh, maybe something with kimchi, maybe some Suriano southern ham, maybe a little bit of this and that and putting it together in their kind of own little world. So I'm, I'm interested to sort of get into into the minds of, of chefs more that way and chefs who um, we haven't uh, heard of before. Yeah, I, 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 I'm in favor of those mashups, but I'm not sure I'd call them authentic anything. No, I'm saying they're, yeah. they're, they're authentic to that person. <laughs> well, yeah. um, the um, I'm interested in watching the transition of uh, creative cooks and chefs uh, doing interesting things in food trucks mm. and having them absorbed by the restaurant industry. Right, because there is a trend of they're brick right, and mortar. They're way ahead. Yeah. Uh, they're, mm. they're ahead because they're willing to experiment. Uh, they're not a creature of a, of a piece of geography. They can take their food to where the people are. Uh, and uh, if, if something doesn't work this week, well, we'll do something else next week. Uh, that level of experimentation, uh, I, I think, is probably the most exciting part of the food industry. Amazing. Greg, what are you, what are you looking forward to? I'm actually with uh, the local chef. I would actually say the same thing. I, I think more just I'm excited to travel more and, and, and have some – I don't know. I was walking around my neighborhood this weekend, and there's a ton of new restaurants and just like looking. And they might as well just call the restaurants like brunch. And just not have anything on there because they're just all some not even like very good variations on a theme. It's like just it's it's just so monotonous that I would rather just go somewhere and be like just serve me something that like I would have not thought of. And it doesn't need to be crazy. Just like something in the sense of like this is even the even where you took today. Like I was not particularly excited, but the, it was like a queso hollandaise, yeah. which actually ended up being yeah. pretty good. Which was like really, supr- but it was like oh, okay, this is. This is at least something different. And they had a uh, they had a pig in a blanket as a garnish for Bloody Mary. That's old. Uh, that is a little see, old. But there's a case see, when you're a old again. Work. <laughs> Darren, and I'm making sure that we know it's Darren, so we don't listen to this in a few years. Oh my be like, god! Was it Greg? Or was it Darren? That's Darren twice. But I took you to that restaurant. Fine, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> What's your last? As, as, as they say in uh, Heritage Radio, your toast. Uh, ah, yeah. all right. We're gonna end on that. Well, bye. Thank you guys so much. There's only one way we can end this year. Pop. You know it's pop. It's our favorite band from Play our favorite UConn. album. No, we already played Yukon. It's the last track off Factory. the album. Yeah, yeah, Factories. 
Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Heritage. Thank you to the Heritage family. Please and, do- and thanks to Liz. Liz, yeah. this was our first seven months together. It's been excellent. Look at that grin. Yeah, look at look that, at that curtsy. Bow. Yeah. And please, please, please make sure to go to heritageradionetwork.org and donate. Uh, it's a great gift for the holiday season to become a member. Uh, you know, we do this out of the love. We do this out of community. And we want to keep the lights and on. And our guests do it for the pizza. The guests do it for the pizza. Thanks not so much for us. Uh, so we'll see you. Michael, we'll see you next year? Sure. Okay. Free pizza next year. Yeah. I'm going to start working on my predictions now. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in 2015. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.